On this edition of Native Report, we meet Chairman Richard Milanovic of the Agua Caliente Band of Cahia Indians. One of the reasons... Uh, we meet Arthur Blazer, the first Native American to serve as the Deputy Undersecretary for Natural Resources and Environment with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. ...is improving the diversity within the U.S. Forest Service. And we continue with Part 4 of Barrel Whalers of the North. We also learn something new about Indian Country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation. Hi, welcome to Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. There are two signs that greet you as you drive into the city of Palm Springs, California. One letting you know you're entering the city, and the other that you're entering the Agua Caliente Indian Reservation. These signs indicate the unique government-to-government -government relationship between the reservation and the city, and that relationship is key to the success of both communities. The Agua Caliente Reservation and the city of Palm Springs, California share borders different than most neighboring communities. Every other square mile is reservation property, creating a checkerboard pattern. Both communities see this as beneficial. Agua Caliente Chairman Richard Milanovic explains. We have strived, and I make it a, I think it's very important to let our membership understand as well as the city understand we're in this community jointly. We sh what happens to us is going to have happened on the same, in the same vein with the city or with our neighbors. So I say, if we can work together on any given issue, we'll all be that much better off. And I think the city understands that, the tribal members understand that. Naturally, there's times when we, we come to heads, we come to locks with one another. But by and large, we, we've learned how to work together. We have quarterly meetings with the City of Palm Springs. We've had uh, semi-quarterly meetings with City of Cathedral City and Ranch Mirage. We have another meeting with the City of Palm Springs coming up where we sit down and talk about the issues that we feel are necessary to talk about in an open forum so everyone understands this is what, what we see as an issue and it gives them the same opportunity to say, we see these as issues, can we come somehow work out a workable, amiable agreement between all of us? And we have. Palm Springs Mayor Steve Pounier cited many instances as to how the two communities have benefited from this unique arrangement. He gave the welcome address of the 66th Annual Convention of the National Congress of American Indians. Some of the things that we have done historically to show each other how important that partnership is, we've partnered on joint federal public lands highways grant applications, entered into agreements on design and constructions of actually bridges here in the city of Palm Springs, I'm very proud to say the city of Palm Springs uh, has this incredible relationship with the Agua Caliente Band of Queen Indians, one that I think is a model for any other city and tribe out there in the country. That is how important it is to us. It was 1977 when agreements were reached between the Cahuilla Nation and the local governments over issues mutually important to both parties. Prior to that time when the city had jurisdiction over our land, which is a big checkerboard, you know, every other square mile is reservation, uh, the other is fee, which was owned by the Seventh Civic, but, and actually it was sold over the years, but you know, individuals owned it. So what we had with, in the city of Palm Springs in the 50s, 60s, up to the 70s was a zoning map showing what Indian land as watercourse, Indian land as low density, Indian land as the bare minimal development which would be allowed, whereas right across the street, high density, high-end uses, commercial. 
from that time on, we've had the ability to control our own destiny. So again, by fate, by fortune, we maintain, we, that's when we began to, within our own right, within our members' rights, to be, be one as we saw fit. As with other communities in Indian country, tribal gaming has made a difference in Palm Springs. It has changed the lives of our members in as much that it affords us the ability to venture out into other economic development. It affords us the ability to fund the education to a, a larger degree, our funding our educational matters, our cultural identity. Education is so important to us. We had a scholarship program within the tribe prior to gaming because we thought education was important to give our members an opportunity, give them a leg up if they so desire. We, we, we just are able to fund it even to a greater extent now and make it widely available to more members to give them a broader breadth of opportunities as far as education, not just, not just your trade school, not just cosmetology or welding school. From the, the perspective of getting a higher education, but also getting a cultural education, understanding who better that you are from, from way back not just from today that you're, you're a tribal member and you have maybe your tribe, one of your tribal businesses is, is a casino, but it goes, much, it goes much deeper than that. It's who you are, what you represent, and how long you've been representing that. And as you go, become of age and as you go forward, that will carry you with that self-esteem and that self-worth. That'll make you a better citizen, both from the tribal perspective as well as the community perspective becoming an asset overall to this great community, to this great state, to this great country of ours. The economic development, you know, we started the, a larger hotel downtown, uh, down on, re on the other reservation, our country hotel. It was a major, major facility. That will be a, of a benefit for years to come, not just tomorrow, or, and you know, for years and years and years. It's, it's setting the groundwork for additional development for us to take use the resources that have been made available to us to the degree that we can better, again, not only ourselves but the community. Having the National Congress of American Indians come to his tribe's homeland is an honor for Richard Milanovic. He sees the event as important for all Indian people from across the nation. Having NCAI here to personally makes me feel very, very proud, and I know our membership is very, very proud. I know our council is very, very proud of having people from across, Indian people from across the country, including Alaska, visiting this great, this great, our home, our Aboriginal home, and talk about, that's what's so important about NCI, is coming, us coming together as a group of people and under, talking about what it means to be Indian, what it means to talk about the issues, the, the heartaches, the triumphs of what can be done. Next time NCI gets together, the people are coming together talking about how nice it is to be who we are and why we feel the way we do. It's a marvelous thing, Ted. It's not something that cannot be taken away. However hard others try to take it away from us, they can't. That's the great thing about unity, staying together as one. And this is just one, another link in, as we build in that chain of life for Indian people. One more link, making us that much stronger. I'm very, very proud. Did you know there's a lot of Indian land within the city of Palm Springs? Over 6,500 acres of Palm Springs is in the name of the Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla Indians. In fact, the Agua Caliente Band is the largest collective landowner in the city of Palm Springs. The band also owns Indian Canyon southwest of Palm Springs, which are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. According to anthropologists, Native Americans have lived beside the tree-lined canyons and hot springs of this part of California for over a thousand years. From 1984 until his death in 2012, the Agua Caliente Band was led by Chairman Richard Milanovic. Chairman Milanovic is credited with improving relations with the city of Palm Springs by holding joint tribal city council meetings. The band became a regional economic power under his leadership. 
In his final years, Chairman Milanovic sought to preserve the culture of the Cahuilla people by building a museum in Palm Springs to educate the public on tribal history. Arthur Butch Blazer is deeply committed to environmental issues, and in his new role as Deputy Undersecretary for Natural Resources and Environment with the Department of Agriculture, he is responsible for the management of 193 million acres of the National Forest System. We appreciate the support from NCAI. On this morning at the National Congress of American Indians annual convention, a break between sessions offers an opportune moment for USDA Deputy Undersecretary Arthur Butch Blazer to discuss his recent appointment. My office, uh, the Deputy Secretary position, is over the U.S. Forest Service. That's my primary charge is to uh, work uh, with the Chief of the Forest Civ Service and his staff in regards to the management of our nation's uh, public national forests. It's extremely exciting. The words out, uh, you know, especially now that I'm here at this meeting, uh, many of the tribes uh, are becoming aware of uh, the fact that I'm in this new position. And uh, they're hoping that uh, the relationships between tribes and the U.S. Forest Service uh, grow and, and become stronger, and that's what I intend to help do. Butch has an esteemed history of working for state, federal, and tribal environmental agencies. As a member of the Mescalero Apache tribe, he brings a Native American perspective to managing the nation's forests. I think that's one of the reasons that uh, former governor of New Mexico, Governor Bill Richardson, hired me. Um, when I, when I left Miscalero, I went to work for the governor for eight years. And uh, basically what he told me is that he wanted me to help him bring the tribes of New Mexico together with the state agencies. This exercise in government-to-government -government relations, whether it's between the state and the tribes or the federal government and the Native nations, is an important concept. You know, you never want to give the impression to tribal leadership that uh, the train's already out of the station. Uh, you want to truly give them an opportunity uh, in regards to any new policy development to have their input right up front and having that uh, be considered throughout the process. One of the reasons uh, that I'm so excited about this position is that one of the priorities of Secretary Bilsack is improving the diversity within the U.S. Forest Service. He wants the uh, very large uh, employee population of the service to reflect the diversity of this country. As an Indian person, I grew up in my elders, uh, my father, who was non-Indian, but uh, he grew up on the reservation. They always told me that sustainability is the key. When you're managing natural resources, you have to do so with great respect. You have to do it in a manner uh, that is good for Mother Earth. And so that's what has always driven me uh, as a natural resource manager. I have no problem with uh, the right utilization of those natural resources uh, for economic development, uh, that's fine, but you do so in a way that it's good for the earth and it's, it's good for your people. When I was uh, at a very early age, five, ten years old, uh, my father managed the cattle program for the Miscalero Apache tribe, and his friends were, were many of the tribal elders who taught me what I know today. And so that's the reason I made the decision to get involved in natural resources. Our young Native people are a passion in, in regards to my helping them understand the value of the resources on their tribal lands. And uh, youth in general uh, across the country, I want to help them uh, really 
reconnect with, with Mother Earth. Well, I've found from my experience in life that it doesn't really matter where you come from. You know, if you're from a reservation or a ghetto or a rich community, it doesn't really matter. It's where you're going and how you plan to get there that really counts. So I've developed a four-step process that I advise young people. And the first is character. They've got to have good character. You've got to be somebody on the inside. A lot of times we had patches on our clothes and my grandfather and my dad would say it doesn't matter what's on the outside so much, it's what's on the inside. You've got to be somebody inside, you've got to be honest, you've got to be credible, you've got to be trustworthy by other people. And then the second part is you've got to have a vision. And when the eagles would fly over, my grandfather would say the eagle can see maybe ten times better than us, but you have something that you can see that the eagle can't and that's imagination. And you can imagine your future, a good future and you can imagine what you need to get there. And that brings up the third point, strategy. You've got to learn every day. You've got to get smarter all the time. I'm 68 years old. I still go to school and I still learn every day out here working with all these other young people. They're always teaching me. So it's a real honor to be with them. And then the fourth part is action. You've got to do it. You can't sit around just talking about it. You've got to get up there, take a chance, have the courage, be willing to make mistakes and learn from them and do it. Next, we continue with part four of Barrel Whalers of the North, in which we learn more about the importance of family, friends, and community. You see it in everyday life around these parts. Family members and friends helping out when an extra hand is needed. You especially see it when it comes to whaling season. Pulling a whale up onto the ice is no easy chore. It takes a great deal of manpower and tremendous support from the shore. A large amount of responsibility belongs to the wife of the captain, the captain's family, and the families of crew members as well. When news of a crew getting a whale hits town, the captain's wife gets busy. Preparation for Nrikai and the Apawauti have begun. We're all already thinking, okay, you need to have some uh, flour for the donuts. You need to think about the crew that's bringing it in. They're going to be hungry. So the main thing is you make some soup something they can eat um, when they get to shore or down there. And you also think about um, those who help towing and those who help cut up. Up here, I worry about, um, you know, fruit that's going to be served as well as um, getting the pots and the stoves ready um, <clears throat> and how well you get this your house ready, you know, you could cover it up if you want because there'll be a lot of traffic in and out and generally you can cover it with cardboard for the next few days. Back in the ice, the people are slowly but surely making progress with the whale. More of the community has come out to help get this huge bowhead up on the ice but now, concerns are focused on the west wind. When the wind changes, west wind, that's when the ice starts coming in. Right now, we want, we want to try and get east winds, or we'll let the wind pick up stronger so it can so go out, blow away. The huge ice flow that has been drifting by them for the past few hours has changed its course and is now quickly making its way towards the whalers. 
I mean, just one big floating ice. It looks like about eight, ten miles long, about five miles wide. I did one big massive ice flow. Many of the volunteers start packing things up and moving them back onto stronger ice. These types of situations are common when you live in the far north, situations that require the wisdom of the elders. They're the ones who have done this for decades and have seen more in their lifetime than we could possibly imagine. The elders are books of knowledge that are only open to their people. They have seen the ice threaten their catches before. They have seen the ice come in and take the whale back into the sea with it. With the knowledge and experiences of these elders, the whale may be saved. Heavenly Father, we ask you right now to keep that ice, even though it looks threatening, to keep it distant until we are done. Desperate attempts are made to get this whale up on the ice before the swiftly approaching ice pack takes the whale under. We don't see it here, but the moment occurred when the decision was made to cut the whale in half. After securing the majority of the whale that was still in the water to the ice they were on, they quickly cut the whale in half. While we were butchering the whale, um, I come in, man, he was, he was calm, ready to come out there. When the captain tell, tell us that we had to cut it in half, so we had no choice. We left the part of the head, so if the weather shifted and if there's an opening, they're going to go back down there and do the same thing again, cut it all up. We got to make sure everybody gets the whole share. Part of life growing up here. A lot of times we lose the whole wheel. Uh, I'm glad they were alert. By cutting the wheel in half, these whalers were able to assure that at least part of this bowhead would be harvested. They would now have to wait for the lead to open and the ice pack to move away from the whale before any more attempts could be made to get the whale up on the ice. With most of the whales still in the sea, the cutters quickly get back to the butchering. When they are through with this whale, the only thing that will be left is the head bone and the vertebrae. They will use almost every part of the whale. The stuff is um, liver membrane from a bowhead whale. In fact, the youngest drum maker in Barrow, 17-year-old Edgar Skin, uses part of the whale to make drums for his dance group, the Barrow Dancers. <laughs> It's a timeless tradition that Edgar has turned into a hobby. Not only is Edgar following in the steps of his ancestors, but he is also helping to assure that the art of drum making will never perish from his people. It's easy to see that he takes his work seriously, spending the time to do it right. Okay, I'm about to put this string around in this groove and that the string will you know, keep the uh, cover on and tight. And as I'm pulling it, as I go, just keep making it tighter. It tightens this part so you can get the right sound. It didn't take Edgar long to put the head of the drum on turning and tightening the head so that it matches the sound of the other drums he has made. 
When he is satisfied with the tension of the drum head, Edgar ties off the sinew and begins trimming the excess membrane so that the drum will look as good as it sounds. It's impressive to witness one of these drums being made, the craftsmanship, patience, and attention to detail. But what's even more impressive is that at one point, an adult or an elder took the time to teach the ways of their people to Edgar so that this knowledge would never get lost in the pages of time. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org and on Facebook. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors here on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. See you next time. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation. And Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Malax Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandon Foundation. <laughs>